you take a spiral galaxy like the one we live in and you study um, what you would expect based on the amount of light and the amount of um, speed because we know that there's re this relationship and how fast the stars are rotating as they're moving around the spiral galaxy we would expect that the stars near the center of the galaxy because there's more light and hence more matter be moving faster than the stars at the edge where there's less light say and less less matter but it turns out when they made measurements of the velocities of the stars near the center versus near the end edge of the galaxies um, in these spiral galaxies they found that they were moving nearly the same speed. And so the idea being there must be some matter there that we can't see called dark matter. And some people liken this to the glue. The dark matter is essentially the glue that holds the galaxy together so that these stars that are at the edge are not just like whipping off into outer space. I would also point out actually the work that was done partially by some, some of the collaborators here at KIPAC with a bullet cluster. Um, that really, I think, made it very difficult for a modified theory of gravity to explain dark matter, that it, that it actually was a particle. Not that impossible, but it, it really, I think, kind of um, solidified the idea of dark matter being a particle. And so I think that's important. And so what exactly did the bullet cluster show? Well, the, the idea behind the bullet cluster is you have uh, two, two big groups of galaxies. Uh, but when galaxies are clustered in, in outer space, they're, they're not really tightly packed. They're sort of like grains of sand in a room. And as these two clusters of galaxies, so these two rooms full of grains of sand, uh, collide with each other, the galaxies pass right by each other. Okay? But what happens is the air in the room, the, the, gas, and the gas in these clusters of galaxies, gets all mixed up. Uh, it's a very turbulent process. Uh, and what you see when you look at these clusters of galaxies that have collided, uh, you see that the, the gas, because it's gotten all mixed up, trails the galaxies. So the galaxies have passed right through each other, but the gas and dust has all gotten all mixed up and all shocked and, and heated and is trailing behind the galaxies. And since the gas and the dust makes up most of the mass in the, that you see in these clusters of galaxies, uh, you would expect that any, any modification of gravity anything that ties the extra gravitational force to the matter we already know about would be concentrated on the gas that was left behind. Uh, but what we actually see when we look at, at the impact of the bending of light uh, at, from background stars as it passes by these, these colliding clusters of galaxies is that we see the, the centroid, the, the, uh, the maximum position of the bending is, is correlated with the galaxies and not the gas and the dust. And this, this suggests very strongly that there was some other component of these galaxy clusters that in addition to the, the galaxies themselves, the gas, a, a dark component uh, which passed right through with the galaxies and was not tangled up in this interaction of, of the gas. So that was sort of in 2006 that that discovery was made. But if you go kind of accelerate forward to where we are now, I think it's a very exciting time because in the last decade, the direct detection searches have made just significant progress in how sensitive they are to measuring dark matter or potential dark matter interactions. They've been able to just become much, much more sensitive. And the technologies that we have available now compared to a decade ago that are able to make these measurements are, are, are much more than what we had back, back, say, a decade ago. And then the LHC has also come online, which provides a complement a, a complementary way of looking for dark matter. And I think even in indirect detection, you now have IceCube, which is making some significant progress. You have Fermi, you have other um, experiments that will be coming online. AMS. AMS, yeah. right. And all of these experiments together are really required in order to understand and, and figure out what's going on. And we're in a fairly unique position that's, that's a little dissimilar from those previous discoveries in that we're really probing uh, this scientific area with very different experiments. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, ATLAS and CMS are both on the same accelerator. Uh, Fermi's in space and uh, CDMS is at the bottom of a mine. You know, these are, these are very different experiments. Fermi and... is looking for dark matter to annihilate in centers of galaxies or other sorts of locations in the universe where we think dark matter accumulates. CDMS and these direct searches, any of the direct detection searches are sitting here on Earth waiting for the wimps to just flow through them. Yeah. Um, they're not even the same 
exact source if you're thinking of it that way. It's not the same um, gun that's shooting the uh, particles in a sense, even though the particles are the same. So, but that's, that's why it's important to do it all, because we need to know that, let's say, for example, we see something here on Earth, and we see something up in the sky, and the LHC sees something too. We need to know that what we're seeing on Earth is the same thing that they're seeing up in the sky, is the same thing that they're missing in the LHC, and that that makes a complete picture. And what's interesting about these experiments you talked about is they all use different kind of probes. So Ice Cube mm -hmm. will be using neutrinos, Fermi mm -hmm. uses gamma rays, and AMS is going to use kind of cosmic rays like electrons mm -hmm. and protons. And so we right. have a lot of different angles to view this problem. Right, and, and what you want to, in the end, what you want to see is um, some experiments giving you a signal, others not, because then you're actually getting the maximal amount of information about how the interactions are taking place. Any one experiment that sees a signal, I think um, people may have a hard time believing it really is a signal. There will be need to be a follow-up experiment with a complementary technology um, that can verify that they also see the signal, that they're seeing the same thing. Because there have been a lot of hints, and they're kind of all over the map. And so you would need that first. And then after that, I think what we do is um, we start trying to understand what the signal is. If you see it just from um, one type of experiment, um, you aren't going to necessarily be able to constrain parameters about the dark matter, its mass, um, or, or anything. And then there will be lots of questions about, is this the only dark matter? Or is there maybe a whole hidden dark sector? Um, I mean, the visible sector is very complicated with lots of different particles and families. Um, it could be that the dark matter sector is, or the dark sector is just as complicated. Or it could be simple. Yeah. And Jody gave a great answer. <laughs>